Hello, my name is Dave Zapponi, and I'm the CEO of ECHO. We're also known as the Educational Council of Homeowners. I want to thank everyone for participating to, in today's community conversation, HOA elections, and understanding the role of an election uh, inspector of elections. It's all otherwise known as an IOE. ECHO is a statewide nonprofit association established to support HOA board members and engaged homeowners. Our mission is to foster better quality of life in community associations through education, advocacy, and connections. For today's event, we have a few housekeeping items. You'll find these on your screen. In addition, slides were sent to registered attendees beforehand. Please take a moment to review your housekeeping, our housekeeping items. You should use the chat icon to report technical issues and to communicate directly with other participants in the webinar. Today, we have a large audience of HOA board members. We will do our best to answer your questions, but we may run out of time before we're able to reach them all. It is important for you to use the Q&A icon to ask your questions. We do not monitor the chat feature for questions. To help us select the most relevant questions, please use the thumbs up icon found in the Q&A feature. Simply click on this upvote icon and select your favorite questions. We do answer the questions with the most upvotes first. Please keep your questions general in nature and short. Questions about specific situations are better asked of your attorney directly or uh, an other appropriate industry professional with uh, familiar with your specific situations. I will respond in writing to some questions in the Q&A feature during the presentation. All other questions will be answered during the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. And I believe we have a short Q&A session during the middle of the webinar. Please keep your questions and responses short and concise so we can address as many as possible in the time available. Complex questions will likely not be addressed. Now, let me direct your attention to your monitor where you can find our disclaimer. None of what is said during the seminar shall be construed as specific legal or expert advice, advice from the speaker, sponsors, or ECHO. If you wish specific advice, we encourage you to contact your attorney or another suitable expert. The information we provide during this webinar is educational in nature and should not be relied upon for specific decision-making purposes. Thank you. Today, we have several sponsors. Please join me in thanking our premier sponsor, Tinley Law Group. Our Q&A sponsor, Silver Creek, Association Management, and our registration sponsors, George Peterson Insurance Agency and Levy Erlinger and Company LLP CPAs. And now we will hear a few words from our premier sponsor, the Tinley Law Group. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to introduce Tinley Law Group. We're an HOA law firm that's been representing homeowners associations for over 30 years. We love working with our client family over a thousand communities in a wide variety of practice areas, including assessment collection. In fact, in 2013, we developed Altera Assessment Recovery, which is quickly becoming an industry leader in the area. Our Find HOA Law web library is also another example of our modern approach to adding value to our clients. We hope to have the opportunity to work with you and to develop a relationship with you and your community. Thank you to Tinley Law Group. Now I'd like to introduce Abigail. Abigail has an applied math degree from Brown University and an MBA from UCLA. She has worked for a number of companies, including Deloitte Consulting, where she worked for in the strategy practice. Before founding Pro Elections, Abigail was the operations manager for a vineyard and winery in the past four, seven years, specializing in compliance processes and logistics. Abigail has spent her career making sure everything gets done properly on time and on budget. Abigail, please begin. Thank you. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I think the first question we need to answer is why are we all here today? 
We are here today because the California legislature enacted a new law in January 2020 that changed the way HOA elections are conducted. The reason for this law is that the legislature believed that too many HOAs were abusing their power to influence the outcome of board elections. So to solve this problem, the legislature created a new election process that is effective, but it is also long, somewhat complicated and easy to get wrong. I hope during this presentation to provide you with information that starts to clarify this process and make it easier for associations like yours to hold elections that your members have confidence in and that comply with the law. During the presentation, I will not typically just read to you what is on the slide. I will let you read the slides while I discuss them. Next slide, please. So what is an independent third party? The law requires associations to have an independent third party to receive and count ballots in an election. You can hire a company like Pro Elections, but you don't have to. Anyone who is an independent third party can be an inspector of elections. On the screen are lists of who is acceptable and who isn't. Acceptable independent third parties would be pro elections, possibly a homeowner, a town resident or a local business person. Not acceptable independent third parties, so those who are not independent would be an HOA manager, a board member, a candidate, an employee of the HOA or the HOA management company, the HOA attorney, or a relative of a candidate or a board member. Please be sure that the inspector you choose is truly independent. We have seen cases where boards enlist friends who are technically might meet the definition of an independent third party, but a friend is obviously not unbiased. This never works out and rarely fools anybody. So this highlights why hiring an election inspector is often the right choice. Pro elections handles 500 elections a year. We have no vested interest in the election results. So this reassures owners that we will fulfill our duties without bias. This gives them confidence in the election results. Confidence in an election is what you want because that is the best way to avoid bitter feelings, accusations, and conspiracy theories. Next slide, please. The duties of the inspector of elections are listed in the Davis-Sterling Act. The specific duties are listed here on this slide. There are nine of them. I'll spend a minute talking about some of the problems that can arise when HOAs use a homeowner volunteer as the inspector of elections or hire someone with no experience. The first thing to know is that ballots must be mailed directly to the inspector of elections by the homeowners. Too often, homeowners are directed to mail their ballots to the HOA, to a board member, or to the HOA manager. This practice violates the regulations and can lead to accusations of ballot tampering. Accusations of ballot tampering do not take place when ballots are mailed to a truly independent inspector. Second, most volunteer inspectors lack the experience and training to properly evaluate proxies, answer technical questions, and respond to any challenges. This means that volunteer inspectors end up having to rely on the HOA attorney for advice, which is extremely expensive. Third, volunteer inspectors lack the experience and training to handle various situations that often arise, such as write-ins, tie votes, and spoiled ballots. Next slide, please. The inspector of elections may handle more than just the duties listed in the Davis-Sterling Act. So the items listed on this slide and more are where pro-election spends the most of its time. It's this kind of work that results in a smooth election process that homeowners have confidence in. And it's these tasks where HOAs, particularly self-managed ones, run into trouble. Let's start with the election timeline. Timelines are critical because they are laid out in the regulations that have to be complied with. Depending on the type of board election, the timeline can be from approximately three and a half months to five and a half months long and contain anywhere from three to six different deadlines. 
Keeping track of all the deadlines over the course of many months is a lot to ask of a homeowner volunteer. Next, there's reviewing the governing documents, which can be a minefield. We have a lawyer on staff who can help out when things get complicated. The governing documents for many HOAs are out of date and sometimes contradictory. An inspector needs to determine when the governing documents are superseded by California statute and when they are not. For example, some governing documents include a long list of qualifications to be a candidate. With the new rules that went into effect in 2020, the legislature strictly limited the candidate qualifications that HOAs can impose. So some of the qualifications in the, in the governing documents may be unlawful. Another example we've had more than once is when an HOA has been operating with the wrong number of board members. For example, they had five board members when their governing documents allowed only three. So working with a professional can help the HOA avoid these sorts of errors. And when it comes to drafting election materials, the trick is making sure they are clear and that they include all the information required by the regulations. No matter how clear you think your election materials are, there's always at least one homeowner who will misunderstand them. Our materials have been time tested in hundreds of elections. If you are going to draft your own materials, make sure you test them out on a few neighbors before sending them out to all the homeowners. And the most difficult part of handling the nomination process is when a nominee does not meet the eligibility requirements. When a nominee is not eligible, the Davis-Sterling Act has a process that must be followed. The nominee has to be immediately notified that they are not eligible and they must be given the opportunity to engage in internal dispute resolution. No nominee likes to be disqualified, but the process runs much more smoothly if a truly independent third party is involved. Otherwise, some nominees get suspicious that the board or the HOA manager is not playing fair. And a lot of what we do is answer questions, which increases confidence in the process. Next slide, please. So an important point to make here is that the inspector of elections is not the election police. Part of our job is to shield the board and the manager from election related drama, but there is a limit. Candidate statements provide a good example. Some owners believe there are rules about what can and cannot be included in candidate statements. In actuality, the HOA is not allowed to edit or redact candidate statements. As an independent third party, we're able to explain the rules to angry candidates or homeowners in a way that would sound evasive or defensive or unhelpful coming from the board itself. We have to explain that we are not the enforcement mechanism for violations of the Davis-Sterling Act. Ultimately, enforcement is the responsibility of the courts and the bar is very high. In order for a judge to take action to overturn election results, they would need to conclude that the outcome of the election would have been different as a result of the violation or supposed violation that took place. Next slide, please. So we received the most questions on the following four topics. Election timing, election by acclamation, proxies, and failure to meet quorum. I'll discuss each of these topics one by one. Next slide, please. So in terms of timing, HOA elections take from three and a half to five and a half months long. Let me start by walking you through a standard election with ballots, and that's on the left side of the screen. With a standard election with ballots, there are three mailings separated by 30 days each. The call for nominations, the pre-ballot notice, and the ballots. The whole process takes at least 105 days since you have to allow for some slack in between the deadlines. Under this scenario, election by acclamation is not an option. Election by acclamation is when the candidates can be declared elected without balloting because the number of candidates is less than or equal to the number of seats up for election. 
Now I'll take you through an election where election by acclamation is an option. That's on the right side of your screen. First, it's worth noting that this is optional. Associations do not have to use the election by acclamation process. Associations use this process when they think the number of candidates is likely to be less than or equal to the number of seats up for election. If that turns out to be the case, election by acclamation can save money because fewer mailings are involved. However, if the election turns out to be competitive, this process will ultimately cost a little bit more and take a little longer than the standard election with ballots. So you can see here on the right-hand side that if the election is not competitive, there is a total of two mailings, mailing number one, the call for nominations, and mailing number two, the nomination reminder notice, instead of three mailings for a standard election with ballots. However, if the election does turn out to be competitive, the total number of mailings on the right-hand side ends up being four because you have two more mailings, mailing number three, the pre-ballot notice, and mailing number four, the ballots themselves. And this adds an additional 65 days to the process. So as I mentioned, pro-elections handles over 500 elections per year. The way we stay on top of all these elections is with the custom-built database that allows us to keep track of every election and all its deadlines. Next slide, please. So another question we get asked about very often is about proxies. Proxies have actually been made obsolete by mail-in ballots. Proxies no longer serve any useful purpose. They are left over from the days when elections took place as a show of hands at an annual meeting. You needed a proxy to vote for you if you could not attend in person. Now that voting takes place by mail, there is no more need for proxies. But please be aware that proxies are still allowed by some HOA bylaws. Next slide, please. So back to election by acclamation, because we do receive a lot of questions about election by acclamation and the timing associated with that. So we'll just spend another little minute talking about that. It is great because it can save the association a little bit of money because there's only two mailings involved. However, it does take some planning to execute. So as I mentioned earlier, it can take as little as 105 days if the election is not competitive because you only have to mail out mailing number one, the call for nominations, and mailing number two, the nomination reminder notice for a total of 105 day long process. And on the, on the lower left there, if the election turns out to be not competitive, so you have the same number or fewer candidates as seats up for election, the board can vote to seat the candidates at a properly noticed meeting after the close of nominations and the election process is over. However, you have to keep in mind that if the election does turn out to be competitive, so you have more candidates than you have seats up for election, you will have to add two more mailings and two more months to the process. You have to add mailing number three, the pre-ballot notice, and mailing number four, the ballots, which is gonna add another two months to the process. We are often contacted by HOAs who want a process with election by acclamation, but they haven't left enough time to do so. So if you want election by acclamation to be an option in your election, it's not too soon to get started six months before the election date. All right, next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move into our first break for questions. Awesome, um, yeah, good to know. Uh, I've got a question here. Uh, and if you look in the Q&A feature, I'm gonna pull this over just a second so I can just look into the camera. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, going to the Q&A uh, function on your uh, computers and put your questions in. Also use the little uh, the thumbs up icon. It's on the left side of your screen there and pick your favorite questions. We'll take a few now 
and then we'll go back to them later on in the in the program. Uh, uh, Abigail, what what uh, you know for a for small associations, say three members or you know three houses or whatever, what's an inspector of election going to cost? For a small association, you're looking at anywhere between five hundred and seven hundred dollars, um, and that would include an end-to-end -end process um, of all the, all the mailings, those required mailings that I mentioned, um, postage, uh, the inspector reviewing the governing documents, the inspector preparing the election materials and mailing them out to ensure the process is compliant, and then appearing at the HOA meeting, typically by Zoom, to open and count the ballots. I think you'd be looking at somewhere between five and $700 for that. Okay, and but you could you could uh, have it done if you're comfortable with knowing the process. You could have it done for basically nothing if you could get some. Yes, some yes. Money. Like I said before, the inspector of elections, um, the only requirement is that they must be an independent third party. So if you have um, a homeowner who meets the qualifications of an independent third party, then you can use a homeowner volunteer. Um, the, the main, one of the main things to be aware of is um, not everything is going to go smoothly. That's where the experience of a professional inspector of elections is very helpful. Um, for example, uh, what happens if there's a tie? Uh, what happens if you have a, a, a challenge or a dispute? Um, that's where things get a little rockier when you're using um, a volunteer inspector of elections. Mm -hmm. But when you only have four, four or five homes in the community, you should be able to avoid most of those. Um, is, uh, is it okay for an HOA management company to collect unopened ballots and verify names, addresses, and uh, uh, on the um, outer envelopes prior to the meeting of opening ballots? Uh, no, it's not. Um, what, the way I like to express it that, that brings it home to people is that the HOA uh, manager or an employee of the HOA management company or a board member or a candidate may not touch uh, completed ballot envelopes. And that, that tends to make people understand. You, you may not even touch them. They're not allowed to enter your possession whatsoever. They need to go straight from the homeowner to the inspector of elections, whether that inspector of elections is somebody that you hire or whether it's a volunteer. It may not um, touch any, anyone else's hands between the homeowner and the inspector of elections. Okay, is that, is that part of the law? I don't remember reading that in there. Uh, yeah, yes. Well, because uh, they, they are not an independent third party. The, the ballots must go directly from the homeowner to the independent third party inspector of elections. Okay. All right. So thank you for that. Is it okay for board members to hand out ballots to membership as long as not campaigning or collecting completed ballots? Uh, that, that is not a violation of the law for board members to hand out ballots. As long as, like we discussed, they cannot then take the completed ballots, even if they're sealed in envelopes from the homeowners. Uh, we discourage the practice. Our practice is that if um, a homeowner needs a replacement ballot, we are happy to send it to them. Uh, what we're trying to avoid is any challenge associated with um, board members picking and choosing who they hand out these ballots to and who they don't. Okay, that makes sense. Um, uh, what should be done if there are no board candidates, no nominations were submitted by the deadline and in the deadline has passed? We recommend under those circumstances that the board vote to extend the nomination deadline. Um, it is, it is super important for board seats to be filled and for HOAs to operate with a full complement of board members. 
um, that is what uh, gives confidence in the decisions that they make is that it's being made by the full complement of board members. So if, if there are no nominations, then we encourage extending the nomination period. And um, part of our process is to try to be as, um, try to promote as much as we can the ability for homeowners to nominate, homeowners to nominate themselves or for homeowners to nominate um, another owner. Sometimes people are a little bit reticent about self nominations. So the ability to nominate someone else can sometimes generate more nominations for you. Also, uh, we send email reminders to homeowners. It's, it's amazing the number of people, even though sending it by mail is required in most circumstances, a lot of homeowners just respond better to email and the ability to enter their nominations online. So making it as easy as possible for them also is more likely to encourage participation. So there are things that boards can do to make it as easy as possible for homeowners to nominate. And that will also be more likely to get, get results for you. Thank you. So uh, if you have a vacancy, some of the governing documents allow you to appoint someone. Is that not something you would recommend then? Go oh, um, ab absolutely. Uh, bo board, boards are allowed to appoint um, members to fill vacancies if, if it's midterm. I mean, elections have to happen when, when the seat is up for election, but if there's a vacancy midterm because someone resigns or sells their property or, or what have you, um, then absolutely boards can appoint to, to fill the seat. And yes, if, if, if good faith efforts have been made and there is truly nobody who is willing um, to serve, then the board can appoint to, to fill the seats that they're unable to fill through election. But, but it is um, much preferable to work hard to get nominations. Okay, so here's a, here's a, I think a pretty easy question. Is the management company a, uh, able to send out the candidate call to nomination letter to the homeowners? I think it's asking, can, mm -hmm. can the management firm send out the letter? Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, the management company can send out the call, um, the call for nominations, the management company can send out the pre-ballot notice, and the management company can send out the ballots. What is required by law is for the, the individual or entity that receives and counts the ballots to be an independent third party. So yeah. the management company can do, can do basically most of the steps in the election process other than receiving and counting the ballots. Now, just because they can, doesn't necessarily always mean that they should. And that is something for each HOA to kind of decide for itself based on the relationship with the HOA manager and the homeowners and the candidates and the board. Is it better just to go with, with the third party for the whole process to increase confidence in the, in the independence of the process and the election results? Or is there a very amicable relationship where there wouldn't be any questions or concerns raised by having the management company take a more active role in the election process? Okay, well, it seems like we, we have 53 questions in the, uh, in the queue here. I'm gonna go ahead and, and get back to the presentation now. Keep putting your questions into the uh, Q&A feature. Make sure you're not putting it in the chat, put it in the Q&A feature and go in and vote, do your upvoting uh, you'll have a little bit of time after the presentation to do that, but we should have a, 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 a significantly more time at the uh, end of the program. So let's go ahead and start again uh, the second half of the program, Abigail. Thank you. All right, absolutely. Yes, and I'll, I'll try to be as efficient as possible in the remaining slides to leave as much time as we can for, for Q&A. Uh, so back to the presentation, failure to meet quorum is a hassle, not a character flaw. And the reason I say this is because HOAs and, and boards sometimes get very distressed by their failure to meet quorum. Like it means that like they are bad people or, or a failure in life. No, it just means that the quorum requirement in your bylaws is probably too high. Now there are several steps an HOA can take to try to meet quorum. Here are some of the steps that we find to be useful. First, we send out email reminders to encourage homeowners to send in their ballots. 
we do this both before the election meeting and afterward if quorum has not been met. Second, we send out replacement ballots to homeowners who have not sent theirs in yet. And it is important to remember also that quorum is met by the ballots themselves, not by people or board members showing up at the meeting. Now, ultimately, the election meeting may need to be rescheduled to allow time for more ballots to come in. And I have to emphasize that just rescheduling the meeting is not enough. Do take the steps I described to remind homeowners to, uh, to encourage them to, to return their ballots, including sending replacement ballots if necessary. Um, and before moving on, I'll take a minute to talk about how reduced quorum works. Many bylaws include a provision for reduced quorum if quorum is not initially met at the election meeting. Reduced quorum gives the HOA another chance to meet quorum if they did not meet it at the original election date. The reduced quorum is typically something like 25% of ballots instead of the usual 50% or more. The HOA governing documents typically handle reduced quorum in one of two ways. First, the election meeting can be rescheduled for a specific time frame, such as at least five days, but not more than 30 days from the original date. And then that reduced quorum number will apply to the rescheduled meeting. Or the HOA governing documents might be silent on the length of the adjournment. In that case, the election meeting can be adjourned for a period as short as five minutes. The reduced quorum will apply to the reconvened meeting and the ballot counting can proceed immediately without rescheduling to another date, as long as there are enough ballots to meet the reduced quorum requirement. That can be a very um, effective way to handle not meeting quorum. And um, it's also worth mentioning that many HOAs are now amending their bylaws or taking the opportunity when they're going through a bylaws amendment um, or, or a restatement to reduce those quorum requirements. You can make them 10% or lower and many HOAs have their quorum requirement as just one ballot. Uh, next slide, please. So, your HOA can definitely take a number of steps to have smoother and cheaper elections. Um, I don't have time to speak about every point on this slide, so I'll focus on the point about eliminating staggered board terms. Many HOAs are moving in this direction, driven by the cost and hassle factor of holding a board election every single year. With staggered terms, the HOA alternates every year between having say three board members up for election and then two board members up for election. So it means an election every single year. With concurrent terms, the board terms are aligned to start and end at the same time. So the HOA saves money because their elections will be every other year instead of every year. And that assumes a two year board term. Doing so, also helps combat election fatigue by homeowners, which drives down their participation. The original reason behind staggered terms was the idea that the HOA benefits by not having all of its board members turn over at the same time. Staggered terms were meant to provide continuity. But in reality, you rarely see an entire board replaced in a single election anyway. So continuity happens naturally, even without staggered board terms. The cost savings of making board terms concurrent instead of staggered really outweighs any slight benefit there might be from staggered terms. And before moving on to the next slide, I'll just cover a couple points here. Things like proxies, cumulative voting, floor nominations, and write-ins needlessly complicate the election process and the ballot counting process and offer no real benefit. Any increase in complication increases the chances of disputes and challenges which you want to avoid. So if possible, remove those from your bylaws if they're there the next time you're doing an update. Next slide, please. So, you can help your election process go more smoothly by having answers to these questions up front. Does the board have an election date and time in mind? 
How many seats are up for election? What are the names of the current board members and which members seats are up for election? Does your HOA typically use cumulative voting? Do you want election by acclamation to be an option? Does the developer still own any units? Does the board want printed candidate statements sent with the ballots? Does the board want postage prepaid return envelopes to make it easier for owners to mail their ballots in? These are all questions that whether you use a homeowner volunteer or you hire someone to be your inspector of elections, you'll want to have answers to all of these questions up front. Next slide, please. Now you can also help yourselves by being prepared for the documents the inspector of elections will request or just giving them, if it's a homeowner volunteer, you'll just need to give them this list of documents because they will need them throughout the process. Just make sure you have these ready to go at the outset and you'll save yourself um, time and, and effort. So make sure that you have your bylaws, CCNRs and election rules ready to go with any amendments that have been adopted. You'll need an owner's list with mailing addresses, their HOA property address that they own and any email addresses. Make sure you have your proposed governing document, document amendments if it's a vote on, on um, amendments to the governing documents. Make sure you have your cover letter or whatever additional materials you want to be mailed with the ballots. For proposed special assessments, make sure you have a document that states the amount, the purpose, and the payment terms of your proposed special assessment. And for recalls, make sure you have a copy of the recall petition. Now, in terms of governing documents, I'll just say a word or two about that. We thoroughly review the governing documents at the outset of every election process. This is very important, particularly with older documents that are, might be out of sync with the Davis-Sterling Act. We enter key information about the governing documents in our database. And our database helps us automate part of the process and keep customer costs down. So that's one reason why it is so important to give your governing documents to the inspector as early as possible in the process. And if your HOA has not yet adopted standalone election rules, please do so. It is a requirement as of January 2020. Next slide, please. So you definitely want to try to avoid these ways an election can go badly. Now, here are the typical problems that we see. Not leaving enough time, especially for election by acclamation, as I discussed earlier. Uh, providing incorrect information on the number of seats up for election and which board members are up for election. Board members who fail to nominate themselves on time. Starting the process for proposed governing document amendments before they are ready, and that's for a governing documents vote. And failing to pre-communicate to homeowners regarding proposed governing document amendments and special amendments. And I'll just emphasize a couple of these points here. Definitely do not start the voting process for homeowners to vote on new governing documents until those governing documents or amendments are ready. Preparing new governing documents always take, takes longer than boards think. So just wait until they are done before starting the voting process to approve them. In engaging in a start and stop voting process adds needless confusion and makes the proposed amendment seem rushed or poorly thought out. Also, spend extra time before starting the voting process on communicating the proposed changes or proposed special assessment to the homeowners. Making sure that homeowners are fully aware of the reasoning behind the changes and taking the time to answer questions before the process begins will go a long way to getting homeowners to vote yes instead of no. If homeowners are at all unsure or doubtful, they will vote no or they will just fail to return their ballot, which has the same effect as a no vote. And then just a reminder that sitting board members still have to nominate themselves to run. It is not automatic. And there's nothing more unfortunate than an angry board member who has missed the nomination deadline and really has only themselves to blame. Next slide, please. 
So this is our last slide before we can come back to more Q&A. So these are the steps and the strategies that pro-elections has found are necessary for a successful election. Needing to decide the election date and the timeline up front. Reviewing the bylaws and election rules with great care. Providing advanced drafts of all the mailings so they can be reviewed. Building confidence through transparency. You want to give homeowners and candidates as much information about the election as possible. So an election webpage we have found is a great way for them to view the timeline, the number of ballots received, and other information. We always promptly respond to emails and phone calls so as not to appear secretive or evasive. And an important point is that we, we don't hand count ballots. We use a scanner, similar to a Scantron that you might have used in school. Our scanner is connected to our database and is fast and accurate. So fast and accurate ballot counting builds confidence in the election results, which is what you want. You do not want hand counting that takes place over hours or even days where each hand count delivers a different result. That is what happens with hand counting and undermines all confidence in the election results. And I'd like to close by pointing out another service we offer that's not typical. Uh, we have an attorney on staff and we make our lawyer available when needed at no additional cost when complicated questions arise. Now we can't offer legal advice, but our lawyer can offer legal solutions to problems. And I look forward to your questions. Whoa, great. We're moving quite along. Uh, I answered several several of the questions in the chat. So what I'd like to do now is uh, use the upvotes. And if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes, uh, go into the Q&A feature, everybody, and pick the best uh, uh, questions. And uh, I will be taking a look at those. And uh, we'll, we'll start with the one with the most questions or with the most, most upvotes. And the upvote's a little icon with a thumbs up, so. All right. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I can say a few words on, on hiring an inspector, if that is the route that your HOA decides to go down. Um, I would say the number one criteria is cost, really. Um, you know, the most efficient providers are going to be lower cost, um, because like pro-elections, they'll probably have at least a partially automated process and you want an efficient election because that builds more confidence with your homeowners. Uh, when evaluating proposals, just make sure everything is included that needs to be. Um, you wanna make sure that uh, you, the proposals include the cost of printing, copying, postage. Um, printing and postage are major costs for, for elections and any inspector that's leaving those out is, is doing your HOA a disservice. Uh, you'll want to be mindful of extra charges for meetings on evenings and weekends or extra charges when the election meeting has to be rescheduled due to lack of quorum. Um, you want to pay attention to maybe what's not included in, in various proposals. Uh, like I mentioned at pro-elections, we include a customer election webpage with every election. Now that means that board members and candidates and homeowners uh, can see at a glance how many candidates there are, how many ballots have been received, and, and can post candidate statements online, for example. Uh, you want a transparent process with transparent information, because that is what contributes to building confidence in the election and will reduce possible disputes and challenges. Okay, so let, let's go ahead and get to the questions now. Let's do an up, uh, the upvotes here. Uh, several of you put, I noticed, uh, put questions in the chat room. Uh, we, we aren't managing the chat room, so if you could re-submit uh, your question in the uh, Q&A feature, then we'll, we'll get to, we'll hopefully get to it. Uh, how is an inspector chosen? Appointment by a board or the president, by management, by a board vote? What's the process for the selection of an inspector of election? Like any other board business, it has to be voted on by the board at a properly noticed and agendized board meeting. So it is the board members who 
who vote to select the inspector of elections, just like they would vote to approve a, a contract for any other service that the, the board might retain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and make sure you check your governing documents. You may have more restrictive uh, requirements. Um, how is it, okay, who conducts IDR requests by disqualified board nominees? Who's, uh, who's responsible for doing the uh, uh, statutorily required uh, IDR, uh, internal dispute resolution? That is a responsibility of the homeowner association. So um, we provide guidance when a homeowner, when, when a candidate um, or nominee is not eligible and needs to be disqualified. We provide uh, the language that the HOA can use to contact that candidate by mail and email to say that they are not qualified. But ultimately, it is the association itself, it is the HOA who, that is responsible for disqualifying the candidate and also for offering them the opportunity for IDR. And that is engaged in between the, the disqualified candidate and the homeowner association. Okay. If after the first, this is the next question, if after the first notice uh, uh, in, an app, in the application or acclimation track, there are no more qualified candidates than board openings, can uh, reminder notices be skipped and proceed directly to a pre-ballot notice? Uh, no, the, the reminder notice is statutorily required for the election by acclimation process. Mm -hmm. The nominations period is 90 days long for the election by acclamation process instead of 30 days long for the standard election with ballots process. And during that time, um, between seven and 30 days before the close of nominations, it is required to send out a nomination reminder notice that not only is a reminder, but also includes the list of, of nominations received to date. Here's a good quick one. Uh, can you uh, do vote by uh, digitally or does it have to be uh, hard, hard uh, paper? Yeah, it has to be, it's vote by mail. Uh, the California legislature does not allow electronic voting for HOA elections. Okay. Our ballot includes uh, a resolution to roll over the excess annual assessment to the next year. It replaces this re uh, resolution when we do an election by acclamation. I don't understand what that question says, quite frankly. I'm well, I, just talking around that, I can say, uh, yes, we include additional measures that um, the board might want added to the ballot, such as the, the IRS resolution 70-604. Uh, that is not required to be handled as a secret ballot election. It's sometimes convenient to add it to the ballot. But if, for example, the HOA forgets to put it on the ballot, it can be handled um, by a voice vote at the annual meeting or show of hands over Zoom, as long as it's um, on the properly noticed on the meeting agenda. Okay, so let's go to the anonymous uh, attendee. Uh, can a inspector of elections, a member of the association, go door to door soliciting ballots uh, prior to the annual meeting and at times wait for the homeowner to fill out their ballot before submitting them? Uh, there's nothing strictly speaking um, uh, illegal about that or contrary to the regulations to have the independent third party go door to door. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's not just about a process that, that adheres to the letter of the law, but also the spirit. And um, one has to be mindful of appearances and, and that what you're describing is ballot harvesting. Um, and could there be a perception among homeowners or candidates that the inspector is trying to harvest ballots from some homeowners and not other homeowners? So I would suggest engaging in that kind of practice uh, very carefully um, because that could definitely lead to some issues and some questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that, uh, and it, but it can also get you enough votes to pass the election too. So there, there's some things to play here. Uh, what pearls of wisdom do you have to help the owner with owner apathy? That is, owner apathy toward elections, I guess. Uh, making it as easy as possible and sending reminders. Um, you know, people get get things in the mail and they just set it aside. So 
Um, we do encounter, you know, boards or, or HRA management where it's like, well, well, we mailed it, isn't that enough? And we all know it's, it's just simply not. Sending those email reminders is hugely important. It gets people's attention and it reminds them to send in their ballot. The other thing that we recommend is including posted prepaid return envelopes. Um, that is a service that we offer and that can increase homeowner participation because people just don't have a, a stamp or they, they can't be bothered. Um, that's a way to drive participation. Um, and then also, if necessary, sending replacement ballots to homeowners who haven't uh, sent theirs in yet, you know, including a, um, something printed on the outside of that envelope, you know, we really need your ballot. Uh, that can that can also help um, increase participation. Yeah, and I and also I'm going to put a plug in here for for the Echo Magazine. If you can see that, you can see part of it. <laughs> so the Echo Magazine just came out and talks about apathy. I wrote a, an article in there, and <clears throat> I think there are three articles on on combating apathy. But one of the things you can do, Jeanette, is make sure that you have uh, in you try you put in tools and techniques to engage the members throughout the uh, organization's management, not just during the voting part. So a communication system, things like that, a, a, a newsletter, make sure that's getting out, make sure you get out and talk to folks. Hall, you can do a town hall and have the candidates talk, you know, try to get some enthusiasm moving along. And, um, you know, uh, there, there are other techniques. One, new, uh, one that I saw was, you know, have a drawing and uh, everybody that submits their ballot you know, gets a, a key. You're not you're not buying the vote, but what you are doing is you're getting people to show up and send their ballots in. So um, things like that. You got to be a little creative sometimes, but people should be engaged, but they're not. Um, <clears throat> let's move uh, to the next one. What if many homeowners do not use email uh, but prefer to do this by mail? Uh, how is equality of all notices handled? Uh, well, we send all notices by mail um, and email is just used as a courtesy reminder to try to drive participation. But for um, HOAs where homeowners prefer to receive notice by mail, this is a, the perfect process for them because all the notices uh, are sent by mail, including the ballots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in, the new, in the new year, we're going to see uh, you, you, have, you will have the option of getting electronic uh, notices. So th these are, uh, the law is changing a little bit, but not necessarily with respect to the HOA voting process. So uh, be aware of that. Um, who runs the election in an HOA, in, in an HOA management company? Uh, board, president, attorneys, inspector of elections. Uh, and I'm, I think they're saying, if I read this right, who, who really is managing this process? Uh, it appears that our HOA management company creates the election material with assistance from the HOA attorneys. Is this the proper thing to do? Oh, there, there's nothing wrong with that, that process. It's, it's, that is not against the regulations. Um, the HOA management company uh, may create and mail the election materials, the call for nominations, the pre-ballot notice, the ballot mailing. Uh, the, what the management company cannot do is receive and tally the ballots. Mm -hmm. So is the, uh, uh, is email permitted then or permissible for uh, the notifications and those notification requirements opposed to oh. snail mail? Right. Um, for the ballot, no. Ballot has to, ballot has to be re returned by mail. Um, with regard to, the, say, the call for nominations and the pre-ballot notice, if the homeowners have given the HOA permission in writing to receive general notice by email, mm -hmm. then those notices can be sent by email and they do not have to be sent by mail at all. Now, in our experience, uh, that seems like a silver bullet, but ends up um, creating more problems than it solves because email is just simply not as reliable. It's, it's great as a supplement to the process we have found, but not as a replacement. Uh, too many emails um, end up in the, in the spam folder or in, in homeowners are much less careful about making sure their email address is updated versus their mailing address. So they might've moved jobs or change their email address and that and the HOA is going off of an old email address. 
Um, you know, in, in situations where the homeowner association has insisted that we send those notices by email only, I'd say at least half the time we then turn around and end up having to send them also by mail because too many homeowners complained they didn't receive it. So uh, it, it seems like it's the perfect silver bullet, but um, I feel like it's not, it's not quite there yet and is great as a supplement to the process rather than a replacement. Okay, that's good. So uh, thank you, Jack, for that question. Uh, uh, Lauren from uh, Schleven, my friend, uh, can the bylaws eliminate quorum in its entirely entirety? Um, I think you know the answer to that, but what's your what you, what do you say about that, Abigail? Yes, there's bylaws that say you know um, quorum is is based on the number of ballots received. So if if the number of ballots received is one then it has met the, met the quorum requirement, or they might just say quorum is one ballot. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's really up to the association what balance it wants to strike between, you know, maybe one, maybe one is perfect, or maybe one feels a little too low and they wanna at least have gotten 10% of homeowners to send in their ballots. But yes, uh, reducing quorum requirements if your HOA struggles to meet it, there's, it's, it's a great solution to that problem. There's nothing wrong with it. And um, you know, having a quorum requirement of 50% or more is just, uh, can be just totally impractical. So looking at changing that quorum requirement to 25%, 10% or less is a really great idea. Yeah, and so, and so one of the other things that you ask if it uh, can be eliminated in, in its entirety, uh, we have California Corporations Code too that we might uh, have to lean on if if you if that's something that someone tries to do, but there is other law out there that uh, that does have implications as well. Um, and uh, so if it's in the bylaws, I think you're asking if it's in the bylaws, you can try to reduce the quorum, but you're still going to have to have a quorum uh, somehow defined. Yes, yes, it's just it's just defining it to be a much lower number. All right, exactly. Um, Judy asks, uh, any way the HOA management company can store all the counted ballots and results rather than the inspector of elections? That's stipulated in the law, right? Uh, they can store the materials after one year. Uh, the inspector of elections is required to, to store the election materials for one year. After that, the election materials can be returned to the HOA management company or, or the board, and they are welcome to store them after that point. Can people have access to those uh, those ballots uh, that are being stored? Uh, yes, absolutely. It is it is a right that and any owner has a right to inspect the election materials during that year, okay. and that includes the ballots and includes the um, uh, the outer envelopes. Okay, but but you would suggest to have an uh, independent person there watching them while they're doing that, right? Yes, yes. That's a process managed by the inspector of elections during that year. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Judy, for the question. Uh, anonymous attendee, I've got a couple of them here. Is it required that the board approve the election committee uh, chairperson? Uh, is it required the board approve the election committee chairperson the ab ability to seek out inspector of election information, services, and proposals? Um, I I wouldn't see anything wrong with that. I mean, the board ultimately has to make the um, has a vote to approve whatever uh, contract they might enter into with an inspector of elections. But as far as having a committee solicit proposals, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that's a, it's a delegated authority for, uh, by, of the board, so they can delegate that. Um, Catherine Henge, uh, how do the election, how do, how, how to do an election by acclamation? So she's if you want, if you want to do the election by acclamation, how, what's the process you use? I know you touched on it earlier. Right. So, um, election by acclamation means that um, at the close of nominations, if there are are as many or fewer candidates as seats up for election, that those those candidates can take their seats as board members. Now, it doesn't happen automatically. The way the election by acclamation process works is after that close of nominations, uh, the board has to vote to seat those candidates. And that has to take place at a properly noticed and agendized board meeting, 
where that agenda item and those candidates' names are, are listed on, on the meeting agenda. Um, and so it's this, it's this formality, but it's a required formality that it's, it's not just some sort of automatic process. You know, the close of, of nominations, you have three candidates for three seats and, and poof, they're magically on the board. No, it doesn't work that way. The board has to schedule a board meeting, has to have a published agenda like it normally does. It has to have on that agenda, the fact that they will be voting to seat those named candidates as board members. That is how it happens. Okay, so thank you for that answer. Is it okay for an HOA business manager to express their opinion of the preferred candidate using their position as an HOA member uh, as they accept uh, ballots from HOA members? Uh, if, if you're talking about um, the, the, the board or the HOA manager as the agent of the board, then no. Um, but if you're talking about you know, individual board members acting as individuals, um, homeowners can absolutely express their opinions. They can, they can campaign and they can express their opinions. They just can't use association funds to do so. And the board as an entity can't endorse different candidates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I get this question an awful lot where, um, yeah, you can have, if you're a member, you can do it. But it gets dicey when it's uh, an employee, if, uh, if I was reading this right, if, if, if they're an employee, probably not the smartest thing for an employee to be by saying who their, their next boss is, uh, because it may not be their next boss. Um, what generated these requirements to elections? For a small association of homeowners, it feels like a lot of compliance with regulations that are outsized, uh, that is outsized to the real life risk. So it's a lot of process. Well, the only thing I can say is that the California legislature took a different view on that. And um, the California, in, in the um, legislative history for SB 323, um, the California legislature specifically said that the reason behind this law was that the legislature believed that too many HOAs were abusing their power to influence the outcome of board elections. And um, assuming that, you know, they were, the legislature was acting on, you know, good information and, and had done its homework, uh, they did not make any exceptions or carve outs based on the size of the association, whether it's four units or, or 4,000 units. All associations are subject to that law. Um, and I, I do have to say that in my experience, some of the most uh, contentious and disputed and accusation ridden elections are those with four members. Um, so it's so, so the, the process, what if basically if you're a very harmonious association where, where everyone gets along and, and no one disputes things, then it's gonna seem unnecessary and onerous whether you have four members or whether you have 4,000 members. Um, but the, the process is in place because many if not most associations don't get along quite so harmoniously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I was part of that legislative process as well. And, and um, I'll, I'll say it's probably the majority of folks that are fine, um, but there are some extremely egregious incidences where um, unfortunately you're, you, it's a broad stroke. The legislature's doing this on a broad stroke. They have to do it for the state and everybody's treated the same. There's no differentiation between size of association or how well you get along. So they, uh, they just have to put in place requirements that uh, seem to be um, really an overreach of the government. Uh, and that's really an opinion because there are associations where it is horrible and they're, and they're managing multi-million dollars. There are $15 million corporations out there. So there are some really bad actors out there. And, uh -huh. and it's not to say that this law is going to remain unchanged. You know, laws ebb and flow. And uh, clearly there was a, a perception and maybe a reality that the pendulum was too far in one direction. 
um, and uh, election elections weren't being handled properly or fairly. Now maybe the pendulum has swung a little bit too far in the other direction, and maybe within the next several years we'll get you know that pendulum coming back just a little bit and loosening some of these um, regulations. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't count on that, but that's <laughs> wishful thinking. <laughs> Once it's on the books, it's hard to get it off. Uh, uh, may the inspector of election report to the office uh, what owners have sent in their ballots, or it should be which owners have sent in their ballots, so that the office can send emails encouraging owners to complete their ballot? Uh, so I, I think the question is, um, is it consistent with the regulations to provide a list, a, a voter list of uh, of who has voted and who has not voted. Right. And the answer is yes. Um, that there is nothing to prevent providing that information. Obviously, we don't know how the homeowners have voted until after the ballots are open. But as far as who has voted in order to then say, send emails to those who haven't voted to try to encourage them to send the ballot in, that information it, it, there's, um, can be shared. Okay, so um, let's go here to the next one. This one has four upvotes. So if you're still uh, there, please do the use the upvotes because we're getting down to the uh, last few questions here. Our election is scheduled for December 22 um, of 2022. We have two directors whose term is up in December. I believe both are hoping to stay on the board. Are we too late to hold our election in December 2022? If so, do we uh, just continue to work as a board until we can hold a, a legitimate election in 2023? Uh, if, if the election process hasn't been started yet, so if the call for nomination still needs to go out, um, then yes, it's too, it, there isn't enough time to hold it in December, 2022. You'd be looking at um, uh, mid February uh, at this point. And most, HOA governing documents do have a holdover provision. So the current board members will hold over until that election takes place and then the new board members can take their seats. Uh, the one point I will make is that even though the election might happen in February, 2023 at this point, that does not change the end of the board term to February, 2023. The end of the board term is still December, 2022, so for purposes of, of keeping track, those board members who take their seats in February, 2023, their terms will be up in December of whatever it is, one year or two years later, depending on how long the board terms are. Yeah, yeah that should, you know, that's, that's why you need an inspector of election, someone to keep you on process. Um, the timetables are really difficult. And I know there, uh, I've, I've gotten a number and reason, one of the reasons why we're having this, uh, meeting today is that I've gotten a number of people that just are confused by the timetables and yeah, you're gonna need to, to delay the election. Would they still be able to act as a director if their term is up and they haven't been, uh, haven't been uh, officially elected again? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's- They're there, but they, will, they are legitimately continue as board members until the election takes place. Okay. And I, I can say with regard to election timelines, we have an awesome election timeline calculator on our website. So if you go to pro-ei.com, so that's pro-ei for electioninspector.com and um, check out our election timeline calculator. It's super helpful and I use it all the time. Okay. Um, may the board offer to answer, okay, that one's skipped. Uh, may the board offer to answer questions from HOA members about ballot items like CCNR amendments, et cetera. So that's not exactly, you know, not candidates, but other type. Y yes, ab absolutely. And the, the more, the better. Uh, the, the more communication around things like um, CCNR amendments, bylaws amendments, uh, the better, the more likely you're going to get homeowners to vote in favor of those amendments. Um, the, the less transparency, the less communication, um, the more likely homeowners, if they don't understand something, they're gonna vote no. 
And if they don't feel like voting no per se, they'll just not mail in their ballot, which is effectively the same thing as a no vote. So um, communicate, communicate, communicate. Is there anything unique about a recall election that's different than a, a, than a general election? Um, not, not particularly. The, there's still, most often it's a recall combined with a, a board election. So um, there still be a call for nominations. Uh, it, it's just the contingent factor of, uh, you know, the replacement will be elected depending on the outcome of the recall, if the recall passes or not. But otherwise, it's it's still um, it's relatively straightforward. The issues just tend to revolve around um, the acrimony is what needs to be managed with those situations. Uh -huh. Okay, so we have a three member board uh, to have resigned. Can the remaining board members nominate two replacements or must a formal election be uh, necessary? If, um, if there is not quorum, you know, one board member does not quorum make if it's one board member out of three. Mm -hmm. So um, a, an election would be the ideal way to resolve that. Um, although they, they can, technically, they could appoint to fill those seats. Yeah, and uh, check your governing documents on that too, to make sure you know what a quorum is for your board and how you may, uh, replace uh, vacancies, because you may be able to fill those vacancies just by an appointment. Um, okay. If, uh, if the return address envelope was not pre-addressed to the inspector of election and in error, they uh, are mailed to the management company, company, can those be given to the inspector of elections or are they invalid? Uh, well, you know, it, it's there, it can open up the election to challenge. Uh, and whether that's likely or not, um, whether it's successful or not depends on uh, the individual circumstances. Uh, but that, you know, that's the problem with not following the regulations. Once you're not following the regulations, you open up the election to possible challenge. But like I said, whether that's likely or not is, is another story. Gotcha. Uh, does an HOA board of directors, um, uh, must they adopt the new election rules for them to go into effect? Uh, do the new election rules automatically go into effect once they're adopted? These new election rules just went out to the members in my HOA to review and respond before the board of directors adopts at the uh, November 22 board meeting. Now, it sounds like they're following the proper process. I mean, there's a, there has to be a 28 day notice and comment period. It sounds like that might be taking place if the draft rules were sent to all the homeowners. And as long as it's 28 days long, then it comes, you know, the board then votes to approve them. But yes, that final step of board approval does have to take place. It doesn't just automatically happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they aren't effectively a, a, a rule until the board approves them as a rule. And so they have to go through the process. So uh, in essence, they could follow it, but it's, but it's not a rule at, until it's voted on and approved. Um, can we have a box that only the IOE can access and uh, access be placed in the clubhouse? I think I've had a couple of those questions. Yeah, yes. Um, just as can, long as the access is just the IOE, right? Yes, ex exactly right. Um, uh, you know, I just have to make sure that the, that the key is kept by the inspector of elections and not that the key is not retained by the HOA uh, management um, or, or the board and that's that's fine. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, I saved one last uh, question uh, from an anonymous attendee, but it's got four upvotes here is, uh, uh, can you give us any um, the latest on the possibility of uh, moving toward electronic voting for HOAs. I know you said that we still do these snail mail in the old school, but yes, you know what's going um, on there. 
I don't have any special insight as to when that might happen. Um, I'm, I'm not hearing that it's, it's being contemplated for any time soon. I'll, I'll tell you that much. I, I, think it's, I think it's one of those devil in the details um, scenarios making that, making that work. But you know, would we be sitting here uh, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, still doing paper ballots? I'd be shocked. Yeah, and, and my two cents on that, and I've been working in the legislature, um, bottom line is that we, we can't seem to figure this out for our own elections and the, the national elections, and they're still trying to get, and they still have problems with the elections, <laughs> and they've got all the money that we have in our pockets to, to do it properly, and, they, and it's still, there's still issues going on there. Um, the, the point is, is that uh, it's a great idea if you can do it, but you have to guarantee that you have this independent review of the of the ballots, make sure it's all done properly, and uh, in order to do that, it's it's going to take a lot more um, uh, research and a lot more credibility in that kind of a system. The best way that the legislature has seen in their wisdom is to look at it in a uh, on a piece of paper, and that's the uh, that's the best trail that they have right now. So old school is what you're going to be seeing for the foreseeable future, in my estimation. Um, I hate to say that because it's extremely expensive, but that's likely going to be the, the process. Uh, and there are forces in uh, the legislature, the uh, lobbyist forces that will not go any other way, especially some of the elder citizens. They are lobbying to have um, uh, the old school process there. They want to keep it. They don't want to learn how to use their computers. They don't want to be... Um, uh, and honestly, it's, it can be manipulated uh, if you don't understand how to use the system. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, my take on this is that uh, it's not going to happen in the near future until we can figure it out on a, more, on a broader scale. And we all are accepting of the public process of using the electronic voting. And it's not quite there yet. I think we got another maybe a half generation here to go through to make sure that we're all comfortable with it. Um, Having said that, um, and, and unfortunately, that's just kind of the nature of an HOA. I want to say uh, to Abigail Padu, thank you so much for your presentation today. Uh, I also want to say thank you to our um, uh, question and answer uh, session sponsors, the Tinley Law Group and Silver Creek Association Management. I think they did a wonderful job uh, and they support this uh, by supporting ECHO. Um, I want to thank you uh, to the uh, the ECHO members for coming today and supporting our ongoing ECHO webinars. For those of you joining us today who are not members, you are invited to become a member. You can join by going to our website at www.echo-ca.org and by clicking on the membership tab. tab. In 2023, ECHO plans to hold more than 70 online events three in-person educational seminars, and more than 30 in-person resource panels. Further, ECHO is celebrating its 50th anniversary, and we have special activities planned throughout the year, including a grand anniversary celebration tentatively scheduled for either Friday the 5th or Friday, May 12th of 2023. We sure hope that you can attend that. Uh, and be on the lookout for the exact date. And then uh, probably in a week or so, we'll, we'll be getting the exact date. We're looking for a venue now. Uh, we hope to see you all at the ECHO uh, 50th anniversary celebration. For our members, please invite your friends, boards, and especially management firms and vendors to join ECHO. If you value what ECHO offers, we humbly ask you, our loyal members, to help us grow. Inflation is causing all of us severe financial strains. I am recommending to the ECHO board that we not increase dues in 2023. Rather, we are asking for your help to increase our membership by referring your vendors and management firms to ECHO. If, you, if only one out of 10 referrals becomes a member, then ECHO will end 2023 in a collective cheer of gratitude. And sometimes all it takes is for a person in authority, such as a board member, to ask the question of their manager, vendor, or neighbor, neighboring HOA, are you a member of ECHO, to get them to join. Please ask the question, 
so the that echo can continue to provide outstanding and frequent educational opportunities to the HOA community. Thank you for that. Now for our other announcements. Our next in-person event is on October 26th. We, when the East Bay Resource Panel and the newly formed Echo Club at Rossmore uh, will meet at the Dollar Clubhouse in Walnut Creek. The topic is the rising cost and availability of HOA insurance. We will discuss insurance denials, wildfire coverage, water damage claims, and liability insurance, among others. We are getting very close to filling up the room. If interested, you might send a quick email to Connor and ask him where we stand on our registrations. Um, also, we invite you, uh, uh, invite any HOA board member to, uh, to, or former board member to join the ECHO HOA Board Members Club. The club meets on online every second Tuesday of the month from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Please join the board members for an interactive peer-to-peer -peer learning experience. Our next meeting is November 8th, and the discussion topic will be managing water costs during a drought and environmental costs. Um, if interested, please click on the sign-up sheet provided in the packet or email Patty Curzet at P Curzet, K-E-U-R-Z-E-T at echo-ca.org. Once again, thank you to our sponsors who have made this webinar possible and to all of you for attending today. ECHO appreciates your investment in education to build a better HOA community 